And I found this very interesting that in the book of Isaiah, which starts out with the king's court, <clears throat> this whole idea of the book of Isaiah being a book of salvation is so influential on the New Testament. Jesus makes a quote or an allusion to the book of Isaiah 40 times in the Gospels. The Apostle Paul, in his epistles and in his, his writings, he makes an allusion or a quote from the book of Isaiah 80 times. In his three written sermons in the book of Acts, he quotes Isaiah five times. So the book of Isaiah and this theme of salvation comes through very strong in the New Testament. And I'll try to make some of these, uh, you aware of some of these as we go through. We begin by looking at the trial in the king's court. And so the, if you're going to have a trial, you've got to have somebody who is the prosecutor. They're representing somebody, uh, they're, they're, they're prosecuting the person that they've got to charge against. It says here, the vision that Isaiah the son of Amos saw. So the, the prosecutor appointed by God is Isaiah. And Isaiah says he saw something. You see, Isaiah's name means the Lord saves. Isn't that interesting? His name itself means the Lord saves. It's kind of like Jesus' name means Jehovah saves. His name means Jehovah saves. They both mean the same thing. And, and as Jesus is all about salvation, he's all about salvation. So... <clears throat> Isaiah has been appointed by the Lord to be the prosecutor because kind of like the book of Romans, he's trying to prove that the people are guilty and need a Savior. If I don't need a Savior, then you don't need salvation. If you don't need salvation, you don't need a Savior. So he begins, just like the book of Romans, with a message of condemnation. And he's going to be the prosecutor, prosecuting the case that the nation Israel needs a savior. It says he prophesied during the reign of Uzziah, also sometimes Uzziah, but he reigns a good, and Uzziah is a good king. The notable thing about Uzziah is he had leprosy. <clears throat> because he had leprosy, his son Jotham had a dual reign or a co-reign with him, and he was a good king. Both of these kings, in the book of Kings says, they did right in the eyes of the Lord. And even though they did right in the eyes of the Lord, did not mean that the people they ruled did right in the eyes of the Lord. Because a little bit behind telling us each time that they did right in the eyes of the Lord, it says, but the high places were not taken away the people still went to a high place. Now, a high place was a mountain or it was a hill, and on top of it, they would put a, an altar and they'd worship a pagan god. And so even though it's a good king, the people themselves were not good kings. And it's like that. Even if you are a good, godly parent, there is no guarantee that your child will turn out that way. Uzziah and Jotham were good kings. The Bible says so. It says they followed in the David's steps, who was a good king. But they had a son or a grandson by the name of Ahaz. And Ahaz was an evil king. It says he did not do right in the eyes of the Lord like his fathers. But he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He was so evil that he sacrificed his own son to a pagan god. And I see a few faces just like jaws dropping. How could you do that? We have a similar thing in America. <laughs> we just don't call it sacrificing your son, you know, on a pagan altar. We just prohibit the right to life of the unborn. <laughs> and it's very parallel. Very parallel. Ahaz was an evil, wicked king. But lo and behold, sure enough, if he doesn't have a son by the name of Hezekiah, who in my opinion is the greatest of all the kings of Israel. 
The text actually says he did right in the eyes of the Lord like his father David. And then a couple verses later in the Kings, it says that he, there was never a king before or after him that was like Hezekiah. He was the greatest of all the kings. And that's why you find somebody who is the, a worthless person who has a child who becomes a glowing Christian. Because it's not, remember in, in John chapter 1, it says, which were born again, uh, born of the Spirit. And it says, not born of the flesh. I'm not a Christian because my parent was a Christian. I have to become a Christian because I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior from my sins. I give this as a little bit of background because Isaiah is prosecuting in times that are both good and bad. And even when they have a good king, the people are not good. During his lifetime, the northern kingdom, Israel, is carried away into captivity, and he's preaching basically to the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem as the text goes on. They are the defendants. The defendants are Judah, the, the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, and the city of Jerusalem, the capital of all of Israel, but primarily the capital of Judah, the southern kingdom. And he is bringing his charge against the nation Israel. He's not making a charge here against all the surrounding nations. He's zeroing just in on God's people. God's people. That's not to say he is not going to make some charges against all the other nations. You go to chapters 13 all the way up to like 36, and he's just charging one nation after another for all their atrocities. But in this passage, he starts out saying, there's something wrong in the house of God. Something wrong in the house of God. Here's the jury. If you're going to have a trial, you're going to have a jury, right? Only it's a different kind of jury. Here, O oh heavens, he calls the entire universe to be a witness. They're not gonna, the jury is not going to make a decision here. No, no, the judge is going to make the decision. He calls them the jury because they're going to witness what is going to take place, the case that is made, and they're going to be witnesses of the righteous judgment of God. And he says, hear and listen, O oh earth. All of creation is summoned in God's courtroom to be the witnesses of what is going down. After he summons the jury, you have the judge. Hear, O heaven, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah goes out of his way to pile up names about God in the book of Isaiah. He'll call him the Lord. This is Yahweh, all capitalized, L-O-R-D, all capitalized. It's the salvation name of God. He's the saving God. He'll later call him Lord of hosts. This translation I'm using uses Lord Almighty, which means Lord of armies. He's got the, all of heaven's armies uh, to back up what he does. You're going to find he's called Lord Almighty. Uh, he's the most high. He, he just piles the names on. But in this one, it's the Lord who is judging, but he calls for his saving name. You see, when Jesus came into the world, he came into the world not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He provides salvation. If you find yourself guilty before God, not having the Savior, then you've brought your own judgment upon yourself because he's provided it, and he offers it to you, and you need to receive it. Even here in his courtroom, he will eventually offer a pardon because God loves and wants all people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the charge. Israel is nothing but a bunch of spoiled brats. <laughs> They're a spoiled brats. He said, I reared the children and I brought them up. He said, listen, I picked you out of all the world. You were nobody. I picked the least of all and I've taken you as a father and you were my son and I reared you all along the way. I brought you up. He says, but they have rebelled against the Lord. They stomp their foot. They're rebelling. They're saying, no, Lord. Kind of like the little boy that was sent to the corner and said, okay, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Israel, 
had all the ritual of being a holy nation, but their heart was far from God. They were rebelling. This is perhaps a worse of all sins because when you rebel, you know what you're doing and you're defiantly doing it. It's not a sin of ignorance. It's a sin of deliberation. You are stomping your foot in rebellion. They were rebelling against their father, God. And I think you and I know what that's like. From time to time, we do that too. <laughs> Here's the charge. The ox knows his master. The donkey knows his owner's manger. Listen, he knows who the master is, and he knows where he lives. He says, but Israel does not know. My people do not know. They don't understand. He's saying they're dumber than an ox, and they're more stubborn than a jackass. And I think spiritually, we've all been there. We know what the Lord wants. But it's not what I want, Lord. You know how that goes. The nation Israel was like that at the time of Isaiah. Isaiah is the prosecutor appointed by God to make the charge. They have spiritual ignorance. Not only spiritual ignorance, they got spiritual corruption. Look at that, right in the middle of this next verse. Children given to corruption. It starts out, a nation... A sinful nation. I mean, there, there's corruption. They're guilty. They're called evildoers. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One. There he is, piling up those names, Holy One. They were a set-apart nation, but they're spurning the fact that they're a set-apart nation, kind of like when a, a discussion of religion comes up and you don't know how to throw yourself into that conversation because then they're going to know that you identify with Jesus. And you really rather not have them ask you. You're spurning what you know. They know the Lord, but they spurn the Holy One of Israel, and they've turned their back on the Lord. Corruption. Now, he's primarily addressing a whole nation, and often we think in governments, and come on, all these words up there, I've got bribes, regulations, officials, corruption, I don't have to tell you about politics, do I, how corrupt it is? I don't have to tell you how the FBI is compromised and it's political hack and weaponized, or the CIA, or the IRS, it's been in the news. Uh, we live in corruption. But, but he's going beyond just the corruption in the government, and he's saying, you know what, because it's kind of like we the people, we are the government. The corruption starts at the bottom, so that when the king, okay, was a good king, Instead of going to the temple and worshiping, they still went to their idols. They still went to their idols. And they worshiped their false gods. In our case, materialism, secularism. Oh, I like this one. I believe in science. And I have to say, which science? The science of the Middle Ages, that the earth is flat? Oh, no, that science changed. The earth became round? No, the earth was always round. Science changes. The word of God never changes. It is always true, always true. There was spiritual corruption in the nation. They're a sinful nation. And now he comes up with the evidence of their rebellion. And this is powerful. He says, look at what happened. You have had rebellious beatings. Why should you be beaten anymore? <laughs> he, he starts to describe it. And you think he's talking about the physical beating. And that's what I put up. This poor guy getting gotten beaten, right? Uh, and, and you watch this every week uh, in the news now. Some guy getting beaten on the subway in New York City. Somebody getting beaten or shot in Chicago. And, and you see these beatings. He says, why should you be beaten anymore? Why should you, you persist in your rebellion? Why will you continue to go without the law? You see, the law, the word of God, was the law for them. And we want to defund the police. We want to let the criminals out. And we, he said, listen, here's the evidence. You are beaten. And he says, your whole head is injured. And here's how I know he's not talking about the physical body. He says, your heart is afflicted. He's talking about spiritual beating. There's nothing more depressing uh, nothing that will, will take you down like guilt. That you know in your heart you've sinned against the Lord. David says, when I was 
with unconfessed sin in my life. It was like God's hand was pushing me down into the ground. My bones wasted away. He's saying here, listen, you know you're guilty because you're experiencing legitimate guilt. He says, from the sole of your foot to the top of your head, here it is. There's no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores. And he's saying that spiritually. You have no peace, no tranquility. You're fearful, you're worried. All these things are coming upon you. He's saying you're taking a religious, rebellious beating. Why would you continue doing that? He says your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Yeah, I, I thought about throwing up some slides from the, you know, the, the summer of love when, when we had all those riots going on out, and, out on the west coast and they're burning down uh, the cities out west. And, and I said, hey, your country is desolate. Listen, there's consequences for not living according to the word of God. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before your eyes. They're laid waste. And, and when they're overthrown by strangers, he's saying, Listen, things are going awry. And then he makes this plea. It's a plea here. O oh, daughters of Zion. You see the, the judge on the throne looks down on Jerusalem as his daughter. He loves her. And he says, the daughters of Zion is left like a shelter in the vineyard like a hut in a field of melons, like a city that is under siege. He's talking about you, you abandon everything. You get out of there. When a city under siege, you, you get out. They're being taken down for the rebellion. And he's saying, why, why would you continue on the path that you're on? And then he says, unless the Lord Almighty, oh, here it is, the saving Lord, of host, he's got armies. The Lord Almighty had left us some survivors. Almost every other translation puts there a remnant. Had he not left us a tenth part, a little remnant, we would all become like Sodom and we'd all come become like Gomorrah. What happened to them? The heavens railed down sulfur and hail and fire brimstone, depends which translation you use, and it destroyed the entire cities. He begins to compare them to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he says, you, you have rebellious perversions. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. He's not talking about the literal city of Sodom. He's metaphorically speaking about his own people, God's people, Jerusalem, He's talking about Judah. He's saying, your rulers are sodomites. That's pretty strong language. It's very condemning. We know what sodomy is because we all read Genesis chapter 18 where the angels were sent into the city looking for any righteous people. And Abraham had bargained it down to 10. If you could get 10 people in there, you know that God wouldn't destroy them. They couldn't find 10. And so the city is destroyed utterly destroyed. Why? Well, we call it today being gay. That is a, and gay pride. What, 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 what about that? There's no pride in that. God, God hates this sin. In Leviticus, it says, a man is not supposed to lay, lie with a, another man like he would lie with a woman. And, and so in our country, we're, we're, we're the same Sodom and Gomorrah in America. He's saying, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God. We've added to the whole list. L, G, B, T. Okay, X, Y, Z. I mean, it just goes on and on. We are as guilty in America as they were in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah and the day of Isaiah. And the only reason I bring this all up is so you get a picture of who Isaiah is preaching to, what he's teaching. 
He's teaching they need a wholesale revival heart change to go back to the Lord God Almighty. He says, you, you've got these re religious perversions. You see, he's really not talking about sodomy. He's talking about their religion is like sodomy. He says, go to the very next verse. You have perverted sacrifices. The multitude of your sacrifices. He says, what are they to me? You think I want more sacrifices? I don't want more sacrifices. I have more than enough burnt offerings. Stop bringing me your rams and slaughtering them. And the fattened animals. He says, I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Here's the deal. Sacrifices were made to fix your sin. He's saying, I don't want you to keep on sinning so you can bring more sacrifices. Stop sinning and you won't have to bring the sacrifices. I take no pleasure in your sinning. I don't take any pleasure in your sacrifices. That's a fix for your sin. Stop it. Stop. You think, oh, I'll just go out and sin all the more because that way I can do more sacrifices and I'll put a big happy smile on God's face. No. You got this all messed up. I was taking some junior hires camping, uh, weekend retreat, and I was picking up this one kid and said, now you got the money for camp, right? He said, oh, yeah, and I got spending money too. I said, what? He said, yeah, well, camp was like 25 bucks. He said, I told her it was 50. So she gave me 50 bucks. I got 25 for camp and 25 to spend. And he said, oh, no, no, pastor, pastor, it's okay. I already prayed and asked for forgiveness. That's exactly what's going down here. You see, they were, they said, oh, I can sin, do any sin I want. Because all I got to do is make a sacrifice. I can pray. I'm saying, I, can, I, I, can, I can do anything wrong I want. And, and I just go to God and ask him to forgive me. The heart was wrong. Their religion was perverted. Their sacrifices are perverted. He says, when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling on my court. Come on, what, what, this is wrong. This is wrong. He said, there's a perversion of your festival. Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. Your new moons, your Sabbath, your convocations. Uh, you, I cannot bear your evil assemblies, your new moons, all these festivals that are doing. And your appointed feast, you know, my soul hates these things that you're doing. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. It gets worse. They perverted their prayers. Hmm. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen because your hands are full of blood. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. And then you think the Lord is going to bless you? Are you kidding me? I had a lady come counseling with me, and, and she said, I know my, that God wants me to divorce my husband. I said, what? And she said, yeah, I know, because I love this other man, and God is love, and God must have put that love in my heart, so I... I I think God wants me to divorce my husband. I said, you got this all messed up. <laughs> and sometimes you just got to be blunt. You're wrong. It's, it's messed up. As long as we live in our sin, how can we ask the Lord who set us apart to be different and distinct? He says here, listen, I don't care how many times you pray, you got to get your act together. You pray that prayer of confession and repentance. And then your life will change. You turn from your wicked way. Whew, these are the charges. Kind of makes you feel guilty a little bit, right? You know, because we all, we've all identified a little bit with them somewhere along the line. We're all guilty. And here's the final argument. See how the faithful city has become a harlot. Woo, she's a prostitute. Jerusalem has become a prostitute. 
She was once full of justice. This reminds me of this city too. Once full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her. But now murderers. 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 I don't want to get all political here. I just keep going. He says, look at your economy. Look at your economy. Your silver has become dross. You know what dross is? When you get the silver, you heat it up, and all the bad components of it that's not silver will boil up to the top. And then you take the dross and you wipe it off because it's worthless. He says, your silver has become dross. Then he adds, your choice wine is diluted with water. It's kind of like I went to the grocery store and I discovered shrinkflation. You know what that is? I went to order, I went to buy some ice cream sandwiches. Now, no kidding. Ice cream sandwiches used to be that big. They were much larger when I was a kid because my hand was so small. They were that big. All right? So I go to the grocery store. I buy a box of them. and I didn't realize until I got home. Those things, I'm not kidding you, they, they weren't even that big. They were, they were like a quarter of the size of the old one. You take the old one sideways and cut it into, you know, three times, you have four pieces, and, and, and that's about the size it was. I said, oh, my goodness. That's what was going on. Their economy, their economy was going down. The money that they had, the silver, was like it was dross, worthless. You get that feeling when you go to buy something at the grocery store today. I'm just trying to show In the day of Isaiah, it was very much like today. And there was a spiritual problem behind it. Look at your economy, he says. He goes on, he says, look at your leaders. Your rulers are rebels, companion of thieves. Oh. How is it we send a congressman to Congress, and they only make, what, 250000 a year? I don't know, maybe some, 200, somewhere along that. And they, they come out millionaires. What is going on here, folks? Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. They love bribes, and they chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless, the widow's case, and it does not come before them. They're only about, put it in my pocket right there. I'll take the money. Corruption was going on in their day. Look at your leaders. Look at your leaders. So the Lord renders a verdict, and the verdict is you are guilty. You are guilty. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the Lord, the mighty one, all powerful, the Lord of Israel, my people, the, he declares, and what he's going to declare, not just simply the verdict, they are guilty, but he goes to the sentence. The sentence is rendered. I'm jumping down a few verses for a reason. 28th verse. The rebels and sinners will both be broken. God's going to break them. God's going to break them. A day is coming when they're going to be broken. And those who forsake the Lord, they will perish. The sentences, they will be disgraced. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks. That, that was, the oaks were, were uh, trees that had been made into pillars, and the pillars were false gods like the Asherah pole, and they were worshiping these false deities, these false ones. He says, you will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You put your delight in the wrong place. You'll be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. And the gardens here is another reference where they're going for their nourishment. You've gone to the wrong place. You've gone to the wrong God. You will be like an oak with fading leaves. You're going to fade away. You're going to fade away. Without a garden. A garden without water. You're going to just dry right up, dry right up. The mighty man will become tender and his work a spark that ignites it. He's the tender and what he does ignites him and burns him up. Both, both will be burned together with no one to put the fire out. That is the sentence. 
But I skipped over the part where there was a pardon that was offered. <laughs> pardon that was offered. God offers a pardon. This is what he says. Just wash and make yourself clean. I got a special cleanser up there. I don't know if you've noticed. I got a red can instead of a green one. It says cleanser right on it. But it says the blood of Christ. First John. One nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Just before that, 1 John 1, seven. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Wow. We need a little cleanser. He says, wash yourself, make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. You see, when you get a real cleansing... You become a new creature in Christ. The old is gone. A new comes. He says, learn to do right. That's what happens. You learn to do right. I've watched this over and over. A person comes to Jesus. My cousin, he was a, a truck driver, foul mouth. He could tell you every dirty joke in the book. And, and the day he accepted Christ, the next day, that was all gone. He met with the other truckers. I said, what's wrong with you, Kenny? You haven't put any garbage out of your mouth yet. I found Jesus. Ooh, it cleanses, it changes you. Seek justice, encourage the, the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. That's all the opposite of what the corrupt government in the previous chapter was doing. Turn it all around, turn your life around. He says, here's how you do it. You need to repent. Repent simply means you're going in one direction. You stop, you turn around, you go in the opposite direction. And he says, here, listen, come now. Let us reason together. Let's just be reasonable. Warren Wearsby says this. The word reason of verse 18 means to decide a case in court. He says, let's, let's get right down to it right now. Let's make the decision. Which will it be? Will you accept the pardon or are you going to reject it? No, I'm thinking, I know what you're thinking. How can you reject a pardon? Well, in 1833, a guy by the name of Wilson committed a crime. He stole some mail from the United States government, and he uh, put a, the mail carrier in an injurious position, and he was found guilty, and they, he had a, they charged him with a capital offense to be sentenced to death. President Andrew Jackson issued a pardon but Wilson refused to accept it. Are you kidding me? This is true. You can look it up. It's true. He'd rather die than accept a pardon from Andrew Jackson. So it was taken to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in 1833 said that you do not have to accept the pardon. You can reject the pardon. You know how come? Because you can reject God's pardon too. And you can be left to your consequences of all the charges the Lord has brought against you. He says, come now, reason. Here's the court case. You got a choice, he says. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If you accept, if you accept my offer, just turn from your wicked way. Trust in me. Accept Christ. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. It's your choice. What are you going to choose? If you are willing and obedient, you will eat of the best of the land, he's saying to his people. If you accept Jesus, you will have eternal life. That's the best that you can get. Pardon of your sins, forgiveness, acquittal, justified, made righteous before God, you're going to get the best that God has for you. And he says, but if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Whew. Deuteronomy, Jeremiah puts it like this. Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Which will it be? Isaiah says, pardon or judgment? Which will it be? Which will it be? I will get relief from my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. He's talking about Israel. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge the nation 
and your dross will be removed, and all the impurities will be gone, and then there will be a holy remnant left, and I will restore your judges and the days of old. Boom. I'm going to change everything back to the way it should have been. Your counselors at the beginning and afterwards, you will be called the city of righteousness of a faithful city. Instead of being called Sodom and Gomorrah, you're going to be called a faithful, righteous city. That's how God works. I once was lost. I now am found. I once was blind. I now see. I once was a spiritual sodomite, and now I'm a religious person wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Which will it be? You see, ultimately, he says, I'm going to redeem my people. Uh, Zion will, rebe- will be redeemed, and justice, or penance, ones are going to be righteous. God says, I'm going to change those who choose pardon. Who choose pardon? Who choose pardon? All of this is still true today. Still true today. We are the accused. We stand before God accused. We've been spiritual, rebellious, spoiled brats doing our own thing. The evidence is I experienced that spiritual beatdown of guilt in my heart and my soul. The verdict is I'm guilty. I'm the wrong one here. I should be punished. But God offers me a pardon. We're in the court. He said, let's decide. You're going to receive the pardon? You're going to reject him. I say, don't delay. Take the offer today. (laughs) Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, powerful chapter in the start of Isaiah that you are a pardoning God. Who is a pardoning God like you? who is so full of mercy and grace like you. Though we are a wayward, stiff-necked, stubborn people and don't often know our master nor the manger you've set us in, you still say, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, my son, cleanses from all sin. If there's someone here right now and they've got that guilt in their heart and they say, God, I need that cleansing. Wash me now. Maybe there's somebody here who's never accepted Christ and say right now, Lord Jesus, be my Savior. Lord, I call upon him to save me. Save me, Lord Jesus. I know that you will. For this is the word of the Lord. There is no higher court of appeal. The judge of this eternal universe has said it is so. If we call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.